You're listening to my viewfinder. I release a new episode every week on Friday. Hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on any of these awesome conversations. How would you summarize your life in one sentence? Wow. Yeah, I have to think about um, that a little bit. Meandering. <laughs> Ooh, one, one word. word. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, I'm just going to go with meandering. Well, hashtag it. It's great. My Viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. This episode is brought to you by Park Power, a provider of electricity and natural gas in Alberta that offers low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who you buy your energy from. If you choose Park Power, your money stays here. Plus, Park Power shares its profits with local not-for-profits that are working to make a difference in their communities. Shopping local is very important to Park Power's owner, Chris Kozowski, and we love local here at the Alberta Podcast Network, so it's a great fit. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Like photographs in particular, like videos are more yeah, fake and real because they show a sequence of what we believe motion and existence and perception to be, but yeah, like an image freezes, presumably, and then the uh, viewer has to sit there, and, well, pr- hopefully they have to sit there, look at it, and think about it. Uh, but, you know, with Instagram, you're right, like the, the swipe and scroll uh, generation, we're losing that too. You're not even, yeah, I can't even remember half the things I swipe through. I'm trying now to actively curate how I consume images on the internet, but... Well, they're even like, you know, on Instagram, they have reels now, which is like TikTok. And um, it's, you know, you you end up finding stuff that might entertain you, but it's not really, I don't think it's necessarily bringing value to your life. And I'm not discounting a value of TikTok or Instagram or anything. There is stuff there and there's um, a lot of great creativity, even in reels, but... It's, it is a bit of, a, of an addiction, a bit of a drug, and you, know, you, you almost can't stop, stop yourself. You know, something is presented to you based on your history of what you've looked at. So you just presume, without even thinking anymore, that this is of value to you because you've seen something like it before and you watched it. And you know, I worry about my kids that way too. Like, can this stuff, this stuff is meant to be, there's this new movie on Netflix, Social, the Social uh, what is it called? I only watched the first 10 minutes of it, but you know, these technologies were designed to, to keep you in the same way I think as drugs were, well, are designed now or just from their very nature can draw you in and not let you go. So um, it's, it is a really fascinating time. And I, maybe going back to printing is, is a way to get a, you know, away from that kind of pull. Can, can a printed photograph like, um, create something for you know, people who might otherwise be just drawn into this virtual world? There's a thought between active participation and passive participation. I guess maybe the roadblock. So, for example, when I hang out with uh, predominantly photographers, you know, photo books and prints and framed images become um, important to them. But do you think, I mean, you've been in print, uh, the printing industry for a while, but you're just kind of going in on your own with this uh, with this endeavor of yours now. Is there an audience for you know, physical objects outside of the photography circle? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it goes, you know, it, it's not even just photographs printing, it's making things. There's a whole craft. Um, I mean, that's what this bottle is back here. I mean, it's from a local brewery um, and it's for basically bringing home a little bit of beer or whatever you want from the, from the brewery, small batches. I actually bought it because I was making cold brew coffee and I thought that would be pretty cool to make cold brew coffee, which I love to, I love coffee. I've been actually like the process of making coffee more than the actual flavor. And it goes back to my chemistry. Um, I really enjoy the process of doing this stuff. And I think a lot of people feel that. And I think I won't call it a backlash, but I think a lot of that, that I think that movement is because people are looking for ways not necessarily to get off their phone, but they do crave sort of that tangible aspect to life. So it's not just artists making photographs. It's people making tacos in a food truck. It's people making small batch beer. It's people you know, going and, and making a record or making their own film or making their own film chemicals. I saw some article about some guy making photographs from sand 
today or some dirt or something. I didn't, I didn't click on it. I, it's a little bit too out there for me. But I mean, people are making all kinds of stuff now. And I think, I think there is value for people. You know, people love to look at photographs. I think it's a great gift for people. And I'm not just saying that because I want to print more for people. I think, you know, especially with COVID, we're enclosed in our homes now. And, you know, I think people are visiting Ikea and buying all kinds of furniture here and there, and they're working from home um, like I am. And this is an opportunity where, you know, the printed media for our own walls or for a friend's wall or family member's wall, or if you make a book, these things I think have real value now that we're sort of in these enclosed spaces. I mean, remember how many people were making bread six months ago. Apparently people still are making bread. I made my own sourdough too. Um, Because... We were, I was home and it's an opportunity to sort of get your hands dirty and get in there. And I love the science of it. So that's part of my interest. But a lot of people aren't just interested in the science. They want to make something. I often characterize uh, COVID as a value checking period. And it's interesting. Um, you know, I'm often accused of being a communist, but, you know, this uh, post-industrialist capital, <laughs> capitalism uh, where the idea of being efficient and uh, being useful to the world requires this many hours of the day focusing on some abstract goal, you know, to make money. Um, and then what energy is left for these creative processes? Like, I, as someone who hasn't held a job in probably four years, I, I've been baking a long time, but uh, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, I, I certainly wasn't baking regularly when I had a night. You can't, uh, you know, the schedule just doesn't work. Am I experientially happier now? Yes. Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, maintainable? <laughs> probably not. You know, at some point I'll probably have to earn some money. Um, but it is it's, it's of- interesting how our lives kind of meander. I mean, I, you know, if I look back on my life, you know, I, I was cooking with my mom and my dad actually quite often as a teenager. And then when I started going to university, I, my first jobs were actually working in kitchens. Cooking is chemistry. So how much did that cooking with my parents lead into my career as a chemist? I worked for a pharmaceutical company. I worked for the Environmental Protection Agency for some years. You know, I have couple of degrees in chemistry. I, I, when I got sort of tired of mixing stuff, I got into light. So I studied light spectroscopy, which is light writing, definition is light writing. So that's when I started to get into sort of optics and lasers and seeing the world, not with my own eyes, but with other tools. And then when I moved to Chicago, I started taking darkroom classes. So that cooking led me into the darkroom eventually, and then back into photography and then back into printing where I'm making stuff. So for me, there's this like pretty clear line of where I got started and where I am now. Now, that's not to say there aren't like meanders if you think of a river. I mean, I'm certainly, you know, oscillating between things, but the very base level is I was given this creativity, I think, from my parents or from, you know, my early life, and I like to make things. And here I am. <laughs> yeah. I- I, I hope that when people listen to this, they won't think that if your kid bakes, they'll become a printer. But <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I just going very, very uh, basically, it sounds like for whatever your experience uh, as a child was, because uh, that's always complex, uh, just being an active participant in something informs how you choose what interests you, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're at home and you can make whatever you cooked at uh, as a teenager, um, then you get have to choose and opt for something that you want to do. There's a field, there are many fields, but in this case, there's a field where you get to mix shit up and then presumably it either explodes or it does, you know, in the cartoonish way. Um, and then all of the, the drudgery that comes with them, you got to learn a fucking lot of academic shit before you're allowed to dump things into a bottle. But there's enough of energy there for you to, to want to do it. Uh, Cause uh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, like what you did, you're, you were asked, you, you know, you went into um, a discipline that forced you to think, that asked you to think, to evaluate the world. And I think, um, you know, to be honest, I, I hope my kids go to university, but if they don't, I'll be equally happy. I think going to university these days is a bit of a, um, well, who knows if it pays off or not. And I don't just mean with money. Uh, I mean, it's great. if I think university teaches you to think a little bit more independently. And not always the case, but, um, you know, but now you come burdened with debt too. So I think there's a, there's a reason for, for not going to university actually too, 
but uh, I don't really know what my point is here, but I think you know, there are lots of ways to learn. And I think if you grow up and you're asked by your parents or by your peers about the world, I think that you will, you know, become a critical thinker. And I think that's really undervalued today. It's really important. If we're going to overcome some of the challenges that we have today, then we need more people who are willing to listen and, and ask and, and talk about this in, in very real terms. That's the impression I have of you and why I think you're in printing. <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> Uh, as much as I might ask questions, you know, uh, from a functional thing, teach myself Photoshop and all this stuff, I find uh, printing in particular, it's like uh, it's like alchemy. There's something about it that even when it's explained to me, you know, uh, my wife used to work in um, sort of like for a, a, a commercial uh, commercial apparel company, but she worked in their marketing and, and printing. So she's a uh, certification in design and she's worked with printers about this. So, you know, sh- she can tell me about paper types and paper weights. And I'm like, I didn't even know paper had a weight. You know, I don't even understand what that means, right? Um, but then on the fine art level, uh, you know, I've seen, what is that, that Japanese paper that looks like uh, rice paper. Yeah, things that are textured, that are translucent. Um, or things, printing out fabric now. Right. It's, um, it's fascinating. And then it's not just you throw a piece of rice paper in your uh, HP inkjet home printer. I mean, there's the technology to even have an ink that will stay on new mediums. Uh, that's, I don't know. Well, I, it's... It's absolutely, um, printing is, is both a science and art. There's no question about it. Um, you know, I have tools that calibrate my monitor and I have a tool that calibrates my printer. So I know my workflow is very good and clean and I know that, you know, what goes in essentially comes out, but it doesn't always come out. And, you know, one of the concepts that lots of people need um, to hear <laughs> is that, you know, when you view a photograph on a screen, versus when you view it on paper. It's, it's not just that one's a screen and one's paper, it's the physics are literally different. You know, with a screen, you have a transmission device. It's literally shining light at you. Um, whereas paper, it's light reflecting and then bouncing off. And some of those colors are absorbed and some of those are reflected. And you have some paper that's warmer and some paper that's a little bit more reflective. You have some papers that are smoother. So how the light interacts when it hits is gonna give you a completely different experience than when you're looking on your screen. So for somebody who's been looking at Instagram for their, you know, for all these years, and that's what they're used to looking at a photograph as, or Flickr back in the day, they'll come in and they'll say, why does my print look dark? Or why, you know, why does it look, why does the color look like this? And, you know, it's, it's because the physics are different. And I remember when I took my very first darkroom class, I took it from a guy very smart guy in Chicago named Richard Stromberg. And I remember sitting in the class and looking at the wall and he had a poster on the wall that was for black and white development. And it basically said, you know, with this, with this color that you photograph, like let's say you're photographing yellow or photographing red, then it will come out as this shade of gray on paper. So, you know, how we see the world and how it renders and on a screen or on a piece of paper, it's, it's its own thing. And that's something that photographers um, have to recognize when they're you know, making an image or when they're printing an image. I have two sort of lines. I mean, I think they're a little bit opposite, but the, the one I think, I think question frame is, you know, how do you as a printer then help a photographer uh, find a medium that you both agree will best express their intent with the image? Uh, and the other is this anecdote. Uh, I saw a debate. Well, why don't we do that? And I'll just write down because I've done this before. I asked too many questions and people are like, what the fuck's wrong with you? So uh, let's ask the question, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a process, but uh, maybe even your opinion. I mean, what, what is it about an image and, you know, an artist's intent that helps them choose how to, how to print it, how to manifest it as a physical object? I think it's important to look back at sort of like what their photography is and where that photography sort of emerges to. And do they want to keep that same line of thinking? Do they want it to look like a photograph? Do they want it to look like something else? Um, I mean, there are some papers, I think, that better render the real world, whatever that is. And there are other papers that give sort of a more painterly look to them. And so how you, you know, that's what I was saying earlier about your voice. What voice are you bringing to this story? There was a photographer, um, Rick Etkin, who I worked with recently, and we did two test prints, and one was on a, what I would call a traditional photographic paper, and then another that was a matte paper. And I honestly didn't know which would be better. You know, I thought both would work well, 
but at the end of the day, it's his decision, it's the artist's decision. And so we both looked at these and I was just, both of us were kind of blown away by the matte paper. I wouldn't have guessed that that would have been my choice. So that's where it's really important to do a test print because at the end of the day, you need to see how it actually looks. Not how you think it's gonna look, but how it's actually going to look. So that's one thing I would think about. But the other thing is, just going back to the voice piece a little bit, how do you want to present your work? And what are you, what are you offering to the world to see? And I think that has to be, when you're choosing a paper, that has to be a fundamental question uh, for someone to, to consider. Uh, do you find people have asked that question once they've, before they've met you? <laughs> or is that a conversation that, do you find? Most I mean, people don't think of that. Most no. people don't, don't think of it. Most people don't even know paper to, to any significant degree. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I mean, I'm, I was in the same position, you know, five years ago, I would say, or certainly when I started in photography, I remember making my first print and thinking how horrible it turned out. And, um, you know, I got no, I think the other piece to this is I got no advice from the print lab about why that was a bad choice or why it came out the way it did. I've gone into print labs, a lot of print labs now, and I would say that my overall impression is most of them don't want me there. And it's not because I'm picky. It has nothing to do with me, actually. I talk to other people, and oftentimes they have the same feeling. Um, I don't know if it's kind of arrogance or what it is or just a, a lack of communication, but most people, I mean, established artists, they know what they want, but most people aren't that. Most people will walk into the print studio and say, I have no idea what I'm doing here. They may not say that, but that's how they're feeling. And they really need someone to say, well, someone to ask the questions that they don't know to ask. So I, I really think that there's an opportunity, that's what I'm trying to do, and just give people an opportunity to learn and go from that step of being a photographer to getting their work out there as an artist. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I have this, I have similar experiences in many ways with printers. And I think it's, I actually have similar experiences in a different light with photographers. I think the type of personality uh, that would rather stand behind the lens instead of in front of it is going to, you know, affect how the general stereotype of what a photographer is like. And printing too, you know, if you're particularly in commercial and, and lab prints, I mean, you're an artisan at home, uh, you know, you're working with a, a deeper philosophical and spiritual sort of uh, connection to what you want this to express. But if you're at the point where, you know, you have 10, 15, 20 employees and it's a mill, to have a moment where you'll sit down with 60 clients a day and just be like, look, I need to know what your image of yourself. I mean, I, I think there's something like that. Also, they work really early, man. I, I, I <laughs> They're up at like five in the morning. It's like bakers. I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of bakers who aren't that pleasant sometimes. Uh, they're just <laughs> fucking tired, man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Getting to work at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. Yeah, man. For their life because of their passion for yeast. It's, uh, right. It's <laughs> well, it's funny when I first started working for, uh, I first started working as a, in a commercial print lab and it was, I mean, I don't know how many images I would go through a day. I'd print probably, you know, a thousand photographs a day, maybe 1,500 on a busy day, uh, maybe 2,000 during Christmas. I don't know. But I'm looking at like all of these photographs and it's not fine art for the most part. Mostly it's just family snaps and, and whatever. But a lot of people don't understand aspect ratio even, which is like the, you know, the length and the width of a photograph. And so I found myself having to like make decisions for people on cropping. cropping. Because if you ordered a four by six, well then, you know, how do you want your image crop? Because you submitted a 16 by nine or, you know, what, or whatever. And so editing is a key concept for any photographer. The photos that you choose to print, the photos that you choose for your portfolio, whether printed or digital, the photos that you share with your friends or the photos that you share on Instagram, editing is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing about photography, um, what you decide to show people. And, you know, some people will come and say, hey, can you scan these um, hundred photographs? And I'm like, sure, quote is this amount of dollars. And then their jaw hits the floor because you don't need them all scanned. What are you doing with these? What do you need the highest resolution? How about we choose the best 15 for, because your project is this, we choose the best 15. And then it becomes, oh, I can do that. So editing is one of these things that every photographer I think needs to know especially when they go into the print side of things. I mean, you could argue that that needs to happen in all social aspects, 
lately politicians posting on the internet <laughs> sharing your opinion yeah what you yeah. say to people <laughs> yeah just to overshare that <laughs> yeah take a step back edit my 150 comments to one um i i'm trying to do that recently because uh my mouth lends me lends me in a lot of trouble from time to time but well, uh, it's funny this is kind of a side topic but i i feel like um yeah i feel like a lot of people overshare me included but I really do think that if, in a sense, if more people shared their their feelings, uh, their vulnerabilities in particular, the world would be a better place. Um, I think a lot of us are, unaf- are afraid to share challenges that we have in our personal lives. And again, maybe some of that's oversharing, but there are a lot of people who are struggling, who do struggle on a daily basis. Um, you know, with COVID especially, a lot of people are struggling financially or um, with childcare and those things. And I really do believe that if politicians or if the community sort of engaged in our challenges and vulnerabilities more, rather than being isolated beings, I, I do think the world could improve. I think that'd be one way. I think the key to that is the word vulnerability. And I, I think the concept of oversharing is the noise we get uh, from, let's call it the, the veneers, the facades of people trying to, uh, you know, uh, front and pretend that they're doing either doing okay or they're worse than they are. I mean, whatever the deeper psychological uh, analyses are. But that's a it's an idealism, I think, uh, to be able to expect people um, to lose that much fear. I, I, and it ties back to photography and printing. I mean, there's an element I think where, like our our friend, um, I wouldn't say it's fear, but he won't necessarily show uh, the work that, let's say, you and I agree would uh, look great in a gallery wall or somewhere in a public space. And there's so many layers to that. And so it's not even that we're right. It's just uh, opinions. But like you said, the more we could actually have an open conversation with that, the more constructive it potentially could be. Um, but uh, I don't know. In effect, uh, herd mentality. People are dumb. You know, society's collapsing. We're all doomed. So <laughs> it, is. <laughs> it definitely is a challenge out there. Right? <laughs> So the other thing I wanted to ask you, so I saw, I mean, I, I saw this video, it was great. Um, I think we spoke about it on the phone, about this Japanese woman, uh, prominent photographer from the first era of street photography. And one of the projects that I thought really stood out, I just saw it somewhere else. Uh, I think it's called Images of Hir- Hir- Hiroshima or something. But, um, you know, I think she was, I think the main backstory is around the 90s or 2000s she was asked maybe even more recent she was asked if she would travel to hiroshima and take photographs and her internal dialogue she says in this interview is like i don't want to go because there are millions and millions of photographs of uh, hiroshima but under uh, being controlled she decided to go for one day or two days just to just to check it out and the thing that struck her and what her photo book is about is um how much color how much color there was in reality but how everything from that era is produced in black and white. And so I saw this other article this morning, I think on Twitter, uh, I guess somebody wrote an editorial about how colorizing photos is like the devil's work. (laughs) It's like, yeah, fucking ruining everything. And so, I mean, that's an opinion, but... Um, was that the know, same article that was saying you shouldn't be uprezzing old photos? Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you don't because uh, yeah, you're altering history. But yeah, right. so yeah. so <laughs> so this thing, you know, particularly as a printer, but also as a photographer, yeah. What what is the relationship? Uh, let's say with a physical print or the way it's depicted in the technology of the time. So in that era, either color film doesn't exist yet, or it's just so astronomically expensive that you know all the journalists are using black and white. Is that more real than the you know burnt red skirt that was left over after nuclear bomb? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, at some point, like, should we be asking if the people who did cave drawings should have used like more red pigment instead of black charcoal? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You know, like, Bison don't look like this. <laughs> I don't know. At the end of the day, it's a representation. And um, I don't think it's healthy for, you know, for people who are like, let the artists do their things, right? Like, I don't know, is, is it really that damaging to up something? I mean, uh, or to colorize something? I mean, I don't know if, if something makes it more, maybe we shouldn't be making World War II movies. I don't know. Like, <laughs> Why not? Why? I mean, I just think it it makes it more real, those things. You know, at what point are you going to stop saying, not you, but uh, as a society, what point are we going to say we shouldn't be doing those things? I mean, I think well, colorizing I mean, is fine. I mean, are you going to stop Anne Frank from writing her, her diary? I mean, like, it's her experience. It's 
an artist chooses to do something, let them have that experience presented to the world. If people don't like it, they have, they have an opportunity to say no. Yeah, I, I was having a discussion with some friends uh, with this little thing called the Podcast Brunch Club. I, I don't know. I've got a podcast, as you know. This one woman, one of our friends, Jen, she had this great sort of side comment that what the world really needs is more citations. And so she was suggesting, for example, on Twitter, uh, if you could tweet but actually list three citations, maybe it's color coded. So it's like green and then people's opinions would come out and like be red or blue. But in the same way, if your art is to up res and colorize an old photo or like this deep fake shit or whatever it is, if there's an asterisk and I as the viewer am allowed to decide whether I like it or not, I mean, what's I don't think there's a harm in it. There's a small moral line where, you know, of misrepresentation and appropriation, but uh, that happens anyways. Uh, it has nothing to do with uprising. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing. You can't control the internet, we know. You can't control life. Um, it just happens. I mean, you can do things to prepare for the unknown. You can do things to make yourself uh, in a better position. But at some point, things happen and you just have to deal with it. And so I don't think we're not going to control what people choose to post on Instagram. I do think that part about, you know, using sort of the copyright aspect about using other people's work without permission, that is something that um, that is important to keep in mind. I know there's fair use. I've had my own work um, used without permission several times, even by a very prominent gallery, um, which is a whole other story. But um, so we, I think we do need to be respectful to other people's work. But within the fair use idea, I don't see what would hold people back, especially for a document that might be 100 years old, has no copyright left, and it is what it is. I agree with you. I, I, I guess my I don't know is just trying to scale back and think about... Uh... Yeah, some of these things, uh, get, talking about getting old at the beginning, I mean, we're in 2020 and the idea of what is out of copyright has shifted so much that it's probably a lot of things uh, that I grew up with now that are probably a lot uh, looser than I'm, than I'm even imagining right now. Yeah, I wonder if well, I, I noticed could... recently on my Samsung phone that um, now I can screen record. Um, so, you know, I can screen record anything, I think. And that has all kinds of like privacy issues and copyright issues. And, um, and I just wonder where that's going to go in five years. I, I know uh, on the iMac, although mine's a 2011, so I don't know if it's just because it's old, but QuickTime, you can't record audio and video at the same time. Oh, interesting. Uh, for a screen cap. I've been thinking about how the word uh, democracy and freedom have actually disappeared in their, their entitlements now. And uh, I, um, I don't know where that leaves me, perhaps uh, <laughs> a, a totalitarian or something, but I, um, I've been kind of scared because I think, you know, uh, to be very judgmental, if I speak to uh, an intelligible, seemingly well-read human being and we speak about what we think is an ideal, then yeah, we can imagine a utopian society where everybody has the best interests and we all act for the better good. But as history shows, uh, that's impossible. Um, it's, it's funny because I keep hearing on the news these days, I think I've heard it three times this week when they're, they're talking about the leader of the free world. And I'm like, is he really, where does the free world come in anymore? Like, I understand why people used to say that. <laughs> I'm not sure why people are still saying that. Um, it's it's funny definitions and how they stick for a long time. That's one of the central tenets for this philosopher is uh, that what happened after World War II is that photography became politicized. And instead of recording information, it became about messaging. And there's uh, an intent that becomes ill because there's money and power involved. But I think it's meant to be benign. And so photography plays this weird role in print or otherwise of informing the rest of the world what to think. And uh, I got into argument about this too with my friend. But, you know, I think initially when they invented that first uh, whatever plate, nobody knew that it could change culture. We just wanted to see what a horse's feet look like uh, at once, 60th of a second or whatever. But art in general, I don't know. It freaks me out a little bit. I, it's why I'm talking to everybody. I uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I like. I think you know. Going back to that horse photograph, like I photograph everything. You know, and it goes back to what Winogrand said that you know the photographs look different than the real thing. And I'm curious how they look. I like photography. I like seeing how the world looks like photographed. Um, I don't know if there's any deep meaning in that. I don't know if that presents any kind of like answers out there. I mean, photography is uh, 
a hobby for a lot of people. And um, I'm, I'm curious about the world and I want to see how things look photographed. And now I want to see how they look printed because that's like a whole nother um, difference, actually. A, a natural evolution, I think, from a viewfinder to a page, right? Uh, yeah. Well, and again, like, you know, the, the three-dimensional world is three-dimensional because we have two eyes. Um, it's, it becomes reduced when we put a viewfinder in front of it with its one eye. And we have to look as photographers through one eye. We get used to that, but that's something that we have to learn. And then all of a sudden we put it back on a print and now it, it takes two eyes again. And then, you know, like how much depth do you put on the frame or what do you, do you put something like cellophane or plexiglass or anti-reflective glass or regular glass in front of that photograph and how do all of those things change our experiences about how we're viewing it and you know there's a meaning there's a philosophy to the meaning of that but there's also just the expression of that image itself so i i love that whole process and like i said i just like looking to see how the photograph is going to look i'm just curious <laughs> that's great i have i just had this quick thought i did this uh, show and uh, i had a portrait of a friend of mine um but i got it framed at this sort of discount for Framer, and uh, it was going to be in the hallway of a of a school, so there's fluorescent lights. So she asked me if I wanted to pay for the anti glare. I was like, oh, of course, you know, I need anti glare. And the picture came out so fucking flat and dull because it there's no glare, right? It's both sides, like it's it's refracting differently. Um, if I had had a philosophical discussion, <laughs> right, with uh, with someone who knew what they're talking about in terms of medium and, and proper glass uh, discussion, and I had an unlimited budget, uh, I would have made a different decision, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. Well, I mean, there are tools within Lightroom and Photoshop now, like, um, like clarity or texture, that really help, again, bring some depth back in your photograph or contrast. You know, all of these things help pull the image from that two-dimensional space into the three-dimensional space. I mean, I don't, I have uh, someone I work with that does fine art framing if clients want it. Um, I do framing myself if somebody needs something kind of quick and dirty, but I usually put a spacer in between um, the glass and the print. And that does two things. It protects the image from sticking to the glass, but it also provides a little bit more depth to the image itself. And so there, you know, these are all important discussions that, that um, somebody who wants to print photographs should have. And if you just go to like your, if you're just doing printing at home and have no experience working with a gallery or a printer, or if you're not talking to other artists, that's a really important thing. Um, actually, that's a funny story. Um, I would say for anyone who wants to get printing or get to learning more, does what we're doing essentially, not necessarily a podcast, but talk to people who know, you know, become friends with them, not, not to use them, but because you're, inter you're genuinely interested in what they do. I have a group of um, three other friends, there are four of us, and um, we're all quite like-minded and um, we've been doing some interesting um, work for the last few years. I had no experience in guerrilla art before. So we decided, one of my friends is a street artist and he does a lot of neat things. So we decided to um, print some images. They were about yay big, like maybe, maybe um, I don't know, one meter by one meter. And then we mounted these on big boards and you know, used like um, water repellent to keep the prints nice looking. And we put these in front of the Emily Carr University on a fence. And um, we didn't know how long they would be there. We didn't know if they'd be there for a day. We actually got confronted by a, um, a security guard, uh, but he let us keep it there. Oh. Um, turns out they're still there over <laughs> a year later, even though like we were actually published in the newspaper about this project that we were doing. But the funniest part about all of this is one of our, one of the art friends went onto Google Maps last week and discovered that they're on Google Maps now. So if you go to this block on um, Google Maps, our artwork is on display. For That's awesome. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> So just, but meet, my point is meet people who, who have the same values as you um, and, and see what you can learn from them. And you're sharing your own knowledge as well. So it's not a, a one-sided thing. It's a give and take. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you giving me this much time. I appreciate it, David. It's nice to chat. I have a new friend. I really need to visit Calgary now. I mean, JC's like, come visit, come visit. And I really need to do that. So if you could tell the world one thing, what would it be? Yeah, I would say... Um, I would say make connections to people who, who you care about. I think that's, it's, you know, once you have friends and family who you can kind of, who you respect and who, who are willing to share in the same way that you're willing to share, I, I think your life really opens up in a lot of ways and you get that kind of support and that network. It's so important. Whether it's for art or, or whatever, it's just really important. So connecting. I'll add print more. We'll add that. <laughs>
Very important to care for. <laughs> this episode was brought to you by the Calgary Foundation. Whether it's funding anti-racism programs, addiction recovery, or food hampers for the hungry, for 65 years, the Calgary Foundation has proudly supported the charitable community to address some of Calgary's biggest challenges. Now, during this period of unprecedented urgent needs, Calgary Foundation renewed its commitment to building a healthy, vibrant, giving, caring, and resilient community. If you're a registered charity looking for a grant, a professional advisor creating a giving plan for your client, or a donor wanting to give back to community, discover a wealth of resources at calgaryfoundation.org and learn more about their work through Calgary Foundation's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All right, so typically I do this at the beginning, but I have uh, war warm-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we get along, so the conversation uh, evolved on its own. But <clears throat> I'll ask you a few questions, and I'll, I use these, uh, I have been using these to kind of frame the episode. So, okay. Uh, there are 15, so I'm going to just parse them and ask. I'm edit them. I'm going to edit them and uh, please and ask uh, maybe, maybe two, three, four at the most. But uh, okay. here's, uh, all right, here's a random one. What's the best meal you've ever had? <laughs> The best meal. Oh, that's so easy, actually. Uh, I went to Costa Rica some years ago, early 2000s, and uh, I was sitting basically in a on the Caribbean in a in a little like um, thatched roof spot with no walls. Uh, I had deep fried red snapper and plantains and some rice, and I've never tasted fish like that before. Wow, it's visceral. Did you take any pictures? No pictures. <laughs> 